started. Um, we are we are recording this session for anybody who cannot attend today. And um, out of respect for everybody's time, we're going to get rolling. So thank you, Dr. Baker, for joining us. Um, I shared with Dr. Baker yesterday, that there's been some questions and concerns that have been brought up since we've been back about why are we here at school? And is it really safe for us to be here at school? And I thought um, she is in a, a better position to speak to this in a more informed way than I certainly can. So um, I'm gonna turn it right over to you. Thanks. Well, um, you know, we, we spoke briefly, Kim, yesterday, just about what's been going on in our community and what's been going on at Manzanita. And, and honestly, you're more privy to that, some of the uh, district data than I am. Um, but you know what we know, and and I talked about this uh, in the in the first lecture I gave. But what we know from international studies is that um, it, it doesn't seem to affect the community levels to have schools open. I'm not sure that that is your main concern, though. Um, it's wonderful that you're concerned about our community. Obviously, we don't want to be exploding the uh, Pima County with cases by keeping schools open. Uh, but that, that doesn't seem to be the case. It doesn't seem to be the case internationally, nationally, or in Pima County. The opposite is, is I think, maybe what people are more uncomfortable with is, is it safe for students? And is it safe for teachers that the community levels are rising? And to that, I would say there's not a lot of great data from Arizona, but it seems to me that there is good data from Manzanita, that you haven't had any case-to-case -case transmission within your school, not even one case. Now, I don't, I don't know about the high school or the middle schools or the other elementary schools, um, but at least in Manzanita, even though you're seeing cases exponentially rise in the community, you're not seeing any transmission within your school. I think that's really important. Um, and if you are going to you know, go home and go under your covers and not leave the house until you get vaccinated, then that is a safer place for you than school. However, if you're gonna go to the grocery store, if you're going to take a walk in your neighborhood, if you're going to be out and about in the community with a mask on, I would say that the risk in the community is much higher than the risk at Manzanita. So maybe maybe that answers your some of your questions. I don't know. I'll stop talking and, and leave it open to questions now. Yeah, that, that's great. And I, I can confirm we have not had any transmission um, on our school campus. We have had positive cases in our school community, um, but not that have been transmitted here on campus. Um, our community is being responsible. They're, they're staying out when they need to be out. So I can confirm that. I, I really want to open it up to questions that people have, direct questions that people have that you might be able to, to better answer than I. So feel free to just, this is very informal, you guys. We don't you can use the chat box if you want, or if you want to just unmute and ask a question, I'm fine with that as well. I I actually have a question about just safe practice and if something is a safe practice. Sorry, I got somebody coming in. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> if something is a safe practice. And so, Kim, please just like stop me if I'm saying too much. I'll be very careful not to say names. It's just more of a situation. Um, so twice this week, I've experienced um, a student comes on their first day and then I get an email that night that their parent has tested positive and that their parent is great to then not send the kid in the second day. Um, but particularly, I guess this is kind of to me, but I teach two groups of kids. So like that happened on Monday night. And then I taught again on Thursday night. And um, this is just very candid, but like I've been in tears at the possibility that I was then exposed and now I'm exposing a whole second group of students. And that feels really bad. Um, I mean, like gut level wrenching bad. And so, yeah, I think you're right when you hit the nail on the head when you said maybe it's not so much that we're concerned at the community level as much as we are concerned about 
the role that we're playing in it here. So that's just, I'm wondering one, is that a safe practice for me to be knowing that I can't communicate um, to my families that of course I have to be very careful and protect everybody's privacy rights. So um, I, I wasn't able to share that information. So I just, I'm wondering if that's a safe practice. And then two, I'm wondering, um, about just you spoke last night about vaccines and the rollout of those vaccines becoming available to educators here within the week and i'm wondering about how much safer it would be for us to be here on campus once we have those vaccines so um those are all really good questions and i think that's speaking to the heart of the matter and um and I, you know, I, I will make some assumptions here that um, that the Pima Health Department was involved and figured out who the close contacts were and then put them into quarantine. Um, Can I clarify? It was yes. It was not the um, the, the student. student who was on campus. It was the, it was the parent who right. was not on campus. Right. So, it, so, so right. we didn't so, report to Pima County because it was not a student or staff member for that particular. We're still waiting for the kid was tested, but we don't have results. Right. Right. So once the, the child is tested and you get the results, then, you know, it's been a week already. So I can see how that makes you very uncomfortable. Um, so there's a few things that I would say to that. Um, if a parent is sick and thinking about getting tested, they should not be sending their children to school. That is a big no-no. And I wonder if there would be an opportunity uh, to re-educate parents on what is cool and what is not cool to do. I mean, if you're, you know, for, for instance, like that last weekend, um, my two-year-old had a runny nose. I shut everything down. You know, we locked in our house until I got a negative result for her. And that, you know, you have to assume that everybody has coronavirus until everybody tests negative and they don't. So, you know, if I was feeling under the weather for me to send my child to school and, you know, we don't know the details. Maybe they came down with it during school. You know, maybe the kid was already at school and then the parents started not to feel well and got tested and got a result very quickly. We don't know the details, but I do think that there would be an opportunity for education there. The other piece that I want to underscore is if everybody is wearing masks, even if the child is positive, the risk of transmission is very low, very low. So to have an asymptomatic child in school with a mask on to transmit to you or another teacher, have you be asymptomatic? Also with the mask on, the risk is not zero, but you're getting close to it because you're multiplying um, next to zero times next to zero times next to zero. So I think the risk is low. It is not zero. I agree with you. And I imagine that's a very difficult position for you to be in wondering if, well, now, now am I a silent carrier and am I transmitting it to all my students? I think probably not. Um, but again, you know, I would encourage you at any point, if you have any question, to get a test. The turnaround time is like 24 to 48 hours, which I know would be very difficult for you to miss school. However, it's probably more difficult for you to be up crying at night and not being able to teach the next day because you're worried. So at any point, if you feel like, you know what? I'm not comfortable with the risk here. I don't care if it's next to zero. If it's not zero, I'm getting a test and I'm staying home until I have a negative result. I think that would be a fine way to approach it. I, I don't know. What do you think, Kim? I, I think that makes sense. You know, we we don't know. Um, we don't know what we don't know. But I, I think that I, I agree with exactly what you're saying. We it's it's impressive to see how these kids are keeping their masks on. They are keeping their distance. Um, and we just, we don't know, <laughs> we don't know what's going on outside in the community. Um, now, I can't remember if I presented to you guys the study on the hairdressers at Great Clips in Minneapolis. Did I talk to you guys about that study? So there was, and I'm sorry, I'm going to fudge the numbers. I'll have to pull it up again. Um, 
there were um, there there was a great clips in Minneapolis, I think, and two of the hairdressers were positive. Uh, they had chills. They came to work. You know, they were wearing masks. And between the two of them, while they were positive, they cut nearly a hundred people's hair. And you know, that's that's close. And um, nobody nobody converted. Nobody got sick. <coughs> It's interesting. It's one of the only observational studies we have a known, a known positive case with a mask, with a mask of somebody who wasn't infected. I mean, it takes more than 15 minutes to be getting your hair cut, I assume. But over a, a hundred uh, clients, no, there was no transmission. I think it speaks to that masks work. These weren't N95 masks. They were just plain old masks. Um, so I think the risk, if you're wearing a mask, is is pretty low. What was the second part of your question, April? Do you want to repeat that? Sorry, the second part of the question was um, about vaccines, and just because the rollout of those is so soon, kind of you know speaking to the safety of how it will look a few weeks from now, as opposed to now. Well, you'll still there will still be a chance for student to student transmission, but 10 days after your first shot, you have somewhere between a 60 and 75% efficacy rate. So what that means is out of a hundred, you know, it's either zero or a hundred. So these numbers are kind of hard to understand, but out of a hundred people who get the first shot and are exposed to the coronavirus, 75 of them will not get sick, will not zero convert. Now, after you get a vaccine, you still have to wear a mask because we, we don't know if you can still transmit the virus. You know, it's not an intranasal vaccine, so you're not creating all these intranasal antibodies. It's just, you know, it's through your blood. So let's say you're vaccinated, you test positive for antibodies, and then you're exposed to the coronavirus, then there's like this, fight that goes on between your body and the virus is the is the virus going to replicate fast enough in your nose before the antibodies can get to it we don't probably not probably not i should say uh, probably not uh, but we don't know yet for 100 percent. so the current recommendations are to still wear a mask even after you get your vaccine i have a question yeah. about the what if you are asymptomatic and, and positive and don't know it and get the vaccine. Is there any, is there a risk with that? No, it's okay. Yeah. They, you know, they're, they're saying that even if you've had the coronavirus within, you know, with the last few weeks, it's okay to get it. And what about, I know there's some fatigue and things that could happen. How, mm -hmm. how strong is that? And do you think it would impact our ability to teach following the vaccine. It may. I would get your vaccine on a Friday. A lot. Of, um, the first, the first shot, no big deal. It's the second shot that that patients are having uh, some mild aches and pains and some fatigue. Would you be a hundred percent unable to teach? No, probably not. You could probably suck it up and teach, but it might not be that fun. Well, I so I did not get the Pfizer vaccine. I got the Moderna vaccine. I was part of the I was part of the original trial, which is which has since been unblinded. So I know I I did get the vaccine, but I was pretty sure I got vaccinated because after that second shot for a day, I was exhausted and I had a headache. I, you know, I wasn't on call. I wasn't operating that day. I could have if I had to, but it wouldn't have been fun. It was just for tw 24 or 48 hours. Okay. I have, a, I have a quick question, um, maybe because I didn't get to watch the fireside chat yet, but as far as the vaccine rollout, maybe this is like a Kim question or, or Dr. Baker question, where will the vaccine be um, administered? And I'm asking, because if you know me, then you know I have like crazy allergies and they haven't decided yet if I can have it. Um, so where will we get the vaccines at so that that precaution can be taken? Yeah, I don't know the answer for the district. I haven't heard that yet. And you can speak to it more generally in the community, Audrey. 
more generally in the community at every um, at every vaccination uh, area, I don't know what you call it, at, at every vaccine clinic, whether you're driving through a hospital or Kino Stadium, there's going to be a University of Arizona vaccine. Ultimately, you're going to be able to get the vaccine at CVS and Walgreens. They have to monitor you for 15 minutes afterwards because all of the anaphylactic reactions that have happened have been within the first five minutes. It's very exceedingly rare um, to have an anaphylactic reaction associated with one of the mRNA vaccines. But all of the, all of the stations will have a monitoring area for 15 minutes. Um, that is the only uh, contraindication to getting the vaccine is if you've had previous anaphylactic reaction to um, to another vaccine. So. Um this is probably more directed at, at Kim. Um, I know you, you don't know what the district, how the district is going to do this, but um, I just want to throw in there from an employee standpoint, I think it would be really helpful if um, the district could set up something where um, like we could get, we could get the vaccine here at school and like, you know, have a mobile vaccine unit or something like that come to the campus and, and vaccinate all of us who want to be vaccinated. I don't know if that's a possibility or probability, but I just want to throw it out there that I, I think that that way it would just be easier so that, you know, we wouldn't have to figure out, you know, where we're supposed to go to get it. Of course. Yeah. And I, I do know that we're really committed to making vaccinations as easy as possible to employees. That's why we offer the vaccine clinic every year with flu shots and other vaccinations. The issue with these particular vaccinations is is how they're stored and transported. And, and so I don't know that that's feasible. Actually, um, Audrey had offered to help facilitate making that happen if it's possible. And I don't know what the status of of that is in the community or if it's gonna to have to be on a, a larger scale. I have a question. I'm just curious, how long do you think we're gonna be wearing the masks for even with the vaccine? I wonder, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, it's gonna it's gonna have a lot to do with when you know, our public health officials feel that we have achieved herd immunity. Mm -hmm. I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, if it's, it, it depends on what the bottleneck is. If the bottleneck is getting the vaccines out and getting people vaccinated, then I bet by midsummer things will look a lot different. But if the bottleneck is that people don't want to get vaccinated, then we, we have a different, different issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have another question and I don't know if anybody else has this. Um, this is, I don't know if I'm gonna phrase this correctly, but I'll give it my go. Uh, so is there a certain number at which, so you have, you know, you have a room full of kids and you have this kid out due to an exposure, this kid due out due up to an exposure. And you know, these are families who have positive cases within their households, but is there a certain number at which you would then advise that classroom to maybe go into quarantine, even though the child is not a de uh, testing positive, but there just seems to be like, you know, more than a certain number. I'm not aware of any data um, like that. It, it, you know, I if if there's a known exposure within the classroom, that that's a different story. But if what you're asking is that there, you know, there's a parent here and they, you know, the kid is pulled out, but the kid is negative. And then there's a parent over here, uh, but the kid is negative. Um, I, I don't, I don't think that there would be a reason to quarantine the whole class. I think what you're seeing is that there's tons of COVID in the community. There's tons of it. It's, I mean, it's everywhere. And, and I can tell you, people are getting it because they're hanging out without masks. That's just, everybody's sick of it. I totally get it. It's the worst. Um, but that's, that's why people are getting it. Well, I, I'm hopeful that, um, that 
the 1B rollout in Pima County will start next week. And even if there's not, so, you know, there's there's been some difficulty um, with the vaccine rollout, you know, internationally, really, but um, also in Arizona, not so much Pima County, we're doing much better than Arizona at large. I know if you look in the news, we're always last on everybody's list. But if you, if you parse out Pima County, we're more like in the middle of the states, <laughs> not last. It's just um, that, you know, grumpy old Phoenix is bringing us down. But, um, you know, I over the next week, there are going to be some other sites that roll out. Uh, however, I know TMC and Banner will be uh, opening up their vaccinations. The second 1B is available. I would go online and try to get an appointment. Uh, I, I have been volunteering at the vaccine clinic at Banner. They have been vaccinating around 500 people a day. TMC has been vaccinating between one and 2,000 people a day. It's unbelievable. And there's a lot more freedom with the appointments at TMC. So if you can't get it through one, try the other, but you might have more luck going through TMC. The online um, application for TMC is very easy. My husband, my husband did it. He, um, he, he's a physician, but not associated with Banner. You just go online, you, you know, download my chart and you make an appointment. It, you know, it takes 15 minutes, it's great. Um, when you drive through the line, you show them your iPhone or your smartphone, or you can print it out on a piece of paper and show them your appointment and they give you the vaccine you're done. So um, I, would, I would keep a lookout for that coming in the next week. The, the Pima Health Department has said in the news January 15th, we have heard maybe even by Monday, they're gonna start opening it up to 1B. And I, I did hear an update from Dr. Camerzel today that she was on a call with the, the health department and as soon as they have that information, we will push it out to our staff. So you can certainly watch the news, but also keep an eye on your email. And if anything happens um, over the weekend, I'm sure we'll push that out to people right away. So, so um, are, are the staff um, going to be designated to the 1B group or the 1A group? Um, you 1B is my understanding. Any anybody in education is that correct? Education workers, so teachers, yeah. support staff, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody who works in the school. So that that's one thing that you and I talked about yesterday, Kim. Yeah. On the drop down menu, it's, it might say, "Are you a teacher?" What they mean is, "Do you work in a school?" Just say yes, and then you'll get your appointment. And I would presume that's for uh, people who are assigned remote right now as well. If they are able to get a vaccine, even though they're working from home, they can certainly, yeah, they're a school employee and they're working to be assigned here. Mm -hmm. What else is on your mind? Stacy, I just wanted to say I only saw the part of the recording from the chat last night, um, but I think it's really good just the education of the community because I know that I've been hearing such different viewpoints on the vaccine from people who I think like have good knowledge. Like, you know, my mother-in-law, she's a nurse. And she's been sharing with me kind of um, more of a nurse perceptive of, of rolling out a vaccine really fast. And so that's been in the back of my mind. And then um, I've been talking to one of my daughter's good friend's parents who's a physician and the mom has a PhD like science background. And she's been sharing with me different articles very similar to what Dr. Baker presented last night. And so I just think that education for the community and for us right now, it's our community, our Manzanita community um, is really important. So I think the more of that information that we can push out, the better off and the safer that our kids will be and will be. And so I, I really appreciated that happening last night. 
Yeah, you know, it was my pleasure. I, I spent a long time thinking about what to say and if I, because there is a lot of misinformation out there. And I thought very carefully about, should I have a few slides debunking the myths? But I worried that if there were somebody out there who really believed in that myth, they would like put me in the, you know, pro-vaccine camp. And I, I'm not pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine, I'm pro-science. So I ultimately decided not to include those slides, but you know, there's an unbelievable number of people who think that Bill Gates put a tracker in the vaccine. It's 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 remarkable. It's remarkable. I I passed one of my neighbors the other day who is a nurse practitioner, and she said, "Yeah, I think I'll get the vaccine, but I don't want the one with the tracker in it." I didn't, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. So, you know, I researched that, you know, I, I thought like, what, what is that coming from? And, you know, it, it all stems from this, um, this interview that Bill Gates gave in the spring. And he was talking about having a digital record of who was vaccinated. And they took that to mean as, you know, we're going to, we're going to track you with some sort of transmitter. I don't know, through the vaccine. Um, you know, but he was just talking about, you know, at, at the federal government level, if you want to be, if you want to be counted as being vaccinated to help us understand herd immunity, then you'll be added to the registry. I mean, we already do that with a lot of things in, in health. We do that with specific types of cancer, you're added to the registry. We do that with lots of childhood vaccinations, you're added to a registry. So that that's not new. We've been doing that for 50 years. Um, but you know that's where the the tracking comes from, and you know what I eventually told my neighbor is, you know, if you don't want to be tracked, you got to throw away your cell phone. I mean, you bought a tracker from Steve Jobs. You don't need Bill Gates's tracker. <laughs> um, but all, but ultimately, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to go too deep on that in our in our talk last night. But yeah, but there's a lot of funny things out there. There was a question that came up in response to um, my post today about with the fireside chat recording um, regarding children and trials on children with, for the vaccine and what the thinking is or the plan is for vaccinating young kids. What do you know about that? Yes, yeah, so I, I know that they are currently enrolling for 12 and up. And I think it's both Pfizer and Moderna are, are opening face uh, there must be phase two clinical trials. I know they've already done the safety. I've, I know they've already done the phase one. So it must be the phase two that they're opening, but I would have to look into that. Nothing below 12 yet though. I was bummed to hear that. I was gonna drag drag Charlie in there. <laughs> but um, but, but that, that's what I understand. So what that means is that there's gonna be another three month lag before we have information on the vaccine for children. Hi, Audrey. It's Tiffany Wiley. I have a oh, quick hello. question. It's nice to see you. Nice um, to see you. Will the vaccine, and you've probably answered this 17 times, and I'm sorry, I just am going to ask it again. Um, will this be a vaccine we need to get every year, like a flu shot? Probably. Okay. And the double duty thing? Will it? No, be probably a not. Okay. Probably not. So Johnson and Johnson is coming out with um, <clears throat> a single vaccine and uh, their phase three clinical trials are not yet done. But I have a feeling if that becomes effective, that nobody's going to shine up for the two shot thing. They're all going to want just one shot. So what the scientific community rumors now are is every year we're going to get one shot for a flu COVID shot. And every year they're going to, you know, mix up the different strains of flu and COVID that are going around. And, and we'll probably get that with our flu shot yearly. Thank you. So... Does anybody else have other questions? I guess to, to, to summarize, um, in, in your professional opinion, are, are we safe being here 
in, in school, in person at this time, given the level of community spread? Can you just kind of summarize for us? Well, I think so. I, you know, I, I don't know for sure. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't look like it's happening in either direction. So it doesn't look like schools being open are hurting the community. And it doesn't look like all of this community spread is causing spread within Manzanita. So because those two answers don't, don't, you know, doesn't seem to be changed from our, from your original decision to open it in late October, then I would consider it safe. Now, is it getting a little dicey with all, you know, the different classes quarantining and this one's sick and that one's sick? Yeah, of course, it's getting harder. It's getting harder to be safe. Um, but, but to me, it means that you guys are not budging on any of your mitigation strategies. I think people are getting sick in the community because they're not wearing masks as often, because they are hanging out inside with people who do not live in their households. That's how this is happening. But to me, it seems like none of that um, fudge factor is happening at Manzanita, which is why it's keeping you safe. I, um, you know, I, I think it may be helpful just to maybe remind the Manzanita community if there's anybody sick in the household and you're awaiting the results or of a COVID test, do not send your children to school, even if they are healthy. I think maybe that messaging will help at this point. We can absolutely do that. Yeah, thank you. Other questions for Dr. Baker before we let her go for the afternoon and let you all go for the afternoon. I'm going to ask one more real quick. Yeah. Um, masks, 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 I know is the huge thing. Um, what about like face shields, you know, with, with everything going up so high, should we be being extra cautious or do you think we are okay with just you know, our average masks that we're wearing, none of us are wearing N95s for the most part. Well, not that I've seen at least. So are we doing okay? Or would you advise us to do anything differently? I think going from zero mask to a mask bumps you up to probably between 80 and 90% effective rate. So what do you want to do for the last 10%? A face shield is fine if you would like to. I, you know, I I wear a face shield when I'm in clinic. Um, I'm a head and neck cancer doctor, so I'm in people's mouths. They're coughing, they're spitting on me. So, you know, I think it's pretty important for me to wear a face shield. Um, they don't have a mask on. I do. Um, I I think that it it doesn't hurt to wear a face shield. Most people find them pretty cumbersome and uncomfortable. I'm not sure you're gonna love it. Um, and I don't know if it's worth the extra 10%, but it might be, it might be in, in your eyes. And, and I, I'm totally fine with that. Now, the difference between glasses and a face shield is probably not a lot. So if you have a mask and glasses on, I think you're probably pretty good. My son's sitting here and, and he wears goggles to school. So he's like, Oh, I heard that. <laughs> yeah, I think goggles are I think goggles are a good idea. Yeah. Should we be as concerned with like kids when they're handling the same objects like a book or anything like that? Because we do have some some things that are somewhat shared, not always directly, but should we be really just as careful with that still or are we okay? I think you're okay. Now, six months ago, we didn't know. So that's why everybody was Lysoling everything and everybody, you know, the mail would come and you'd Lysol your mail and <laughs> the groceries would come and you'd Lysol all the groceries. The, um, the coronavirus has not really been shown to be transmitted via fomites. Now, fomite is a medical word for an inanimate object where one person touches it and then the next person touches it and they get sick. Mm -hmm. It's really a respiratory virus. So you're getting it from respiratory clouds. So there hasn't been a lot of evidence that fomite transmission is important. 
Um, I don't want to say, oh, yeah, that's great. Everybody go lick your pencils. It's all good. You know, put your boogers all over them. You know, everything's good. It's probably not. I mean, I don't think it's bad to be careful about it. Um, but I, I, I don't think you have to go crazy about it. I really don't. I would go crazy about the masks. And if you want to get really crazy, like buy some goggles. It's awesome. Thank you. I see that you put your um, cell phone number in the chat box. Thank you very much. So I presume if anybody has follow-up questions, they can certainly contact you. Um, yes, I'm best, I'm best reached by text. Um, you can try to call me, but I might be in the middle of a, a three-kid uh, snowstorm. Um, but I know you know what that looks like, so. <laughs> <laughs> that we do. That we do. All right. Well, we will go ahead and, and wrap up here. And Audrey, I can't thank you enough. We, we think you are such a, a valuable uh, resource and um, member of our community. You're, you're really wonderful. So thank you. And, and thanks, everybody, for My tuning absolute in. Pleasure. Yeah. I'll share this out with everybody a little later this afternoon when I get the recording in case you missed it or somebody didn't get a chance to watch. Have a thank wonderful you. weekend, everyone. <laughs> See you later. Do you want to just stay in chat? <laughs> yeah, let me just stop recording.